Welcome, YouTube, back to another interview that I'm going to have here today with a very fascinating guest. Uh, he is a Catholic apologist, first and foremost, uh, an international speaker and debater that has participated in over 70 live and moderated debates, uh, publish of no, publisher of no, numerous articles on his website, as well as journals and magazines, and at the time, at this moment, is also the author uh, and has have two published books here. Uh, let me see if I can get him on the camera. Here we go. Mary Amongst the uh, Evangelists, The Definitive Guide for Solving Biblical Questions About Mary. We're going to jump into that because I know we got a lot of questions there. And then also The Secret History of Transubstantiation, Pulling Back the Veil on the Eucharist. So he's the, an author of those two books, and his vision and wish is that everyone come to a fuller understanding of the early church fathers, uh, especially having played such an instrumental role in his conversion to the faith. Uh, and it's his wish and honor to, tr uh, to, uh, to honor the triune God by honoring those that served him the fullest. Yeah. Please help me give a warm welcome to William Albrecht. Thrilled to be here with you, brother. Just really thrilled. Um, love, love your um, uh, your cross in the back, your St. Joseph, uh, everything you've got. Incredible, beautiful. Yeah, thank you. You know, one of the things that I really appreciate about, appreciate about the faith is the beauty. Beauty oh, yeah. is honored. And so before we jump into all the amazing things that I want to talk to you about, this is going to be fun. Uh, I have my very first question is about you, which yeah. is... What exactly is an apologist, and so how does yeah. someone become one? Yeah, so when we talk about being an apologist, really is break it down very simply. One who defends the faith. You defend the tenets of the faith against those that are perhaps uh, not within any uh, faith, perhaps atheists, or those that are Protestant or part of other faiths. You do it in a charitable kind of manner, but you, you can be very firm as well, as long as you do not lose your charity, you attempt to show them the truth. And by doing that, you are able to unveil what scripture says. And as you talked about a little while ago, what the early church fathers say. So primarily, I do a lot of theological work. I do a lot of writing, uh, I, but mainly I debate a lot. I've been debating for a while. Um, and I wanna say that, um, Right now, I'm debating probably about 10 to 15 times a year. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, the goal all the time is never, I don't want any glory for myself. I don't, I don't want any glory. It's all glory to God. People may say, well, why do you honor the saints, uh, Holy Mary and all these other individuals if you want to give honor to, to God? Well, we believe within the ancient apostolic faith that if you honor Holy Mary, you honor St. Joseph and all those great, heroes and heroines of the faith that you are ultimately giving all honor and glory to God. And that is primarily what an apologist should do. Now, you were always a Christian, from what I understand, but you mm -hmm. converted to the faith. What made you decide to make that decision where now you've taken on a faith with tremendous dogma and a lot of mm -hmm. uh, misconceptions, perhaps, uh, yeah. rather than just, you know, sticking with the run-of-the-mill Protestant uh, Christianity? It really was um, a number of things. So I, I began really digging in to biblical theological studies, very deep. And I recall uh, the very first thing that got me on my journey was realizing that the books of the Bible or the Protestant Bible was smaller than the Catholic Bible, if you will, meaning that there were a number of books that were lacking from there. And I remember looking at a Catholic Bible and noticing there are more, seven more, and additions to Would chapters. you be willing to just tell us what is perhaps one of the Protestant Bibles as opposed to a Catholic Bible? Yeah, for me, I love using, it's very traditional Catholic Bible, I love using the Dewey Reims Bible. I love that Bible. There are others, the New, New Revised Standard Version, uh, uh, Catholic Edition. There is a New American Bible. There are other Catholic editions. 
I like using the Douay Reims, even though the English is a little old because it's a classical, traditional Catholic Bible based upon the readings from the Latin Vulgate. But there are Protestant Bibles such as um, King James, uh, New King James, uh, NRSV and multiple others, and they lack seven books that are, are included in the Catholic Bible. That was what really piqued my interest. Hmm. At the time, though, at the time, I was wondering why did those pesky Catholics add them to the Bible? And I remember talking to the head pastor of the church I was a part of, and he made the grand mistake of telling me, look, go study the issue. You're going to find the Catholics added those. Those were never part of the Bible. Well, that was the very first step I, when I began studying. And I was shell-shocked to realize that those seven books and chapter editions were there from the very beginning. Uh, that was step one. Other things eventually came, but that really did blow me away. And indeed, if you are to truly believe that the Bible is the Word of God the inspired, inerrant Word of God, well, you're going to want to have the complete inspired, inerrant Word of God. And that, to me, was a major problem, Elliot. And it was a problem that was insurmountable. And today, to this day, I think it is a major issue within Protestantism, the fact that they have an incomplete Bible. And it's a problem that they, I don't think they can overcome unless they become Catholic. That's such an interesting thing to uh, people who believe in Solo Scriptura meaning that the Bible is all and the end all, but then to mm -hmm. have a dwarfed version of it. I'm curious, what no. are some of those books that were removed and why? Yeah, so we, off the top of my head, I know I'm always gonna forget one. You've got one Maccabees, two Maccabees, Tobit, Wisdom, Baruch, um, and I always forget a few of them. So there are two more that I left out there. Uh, which ones are they? Did I say Judith? Um, well, anyway, there are seven. In a moment, I'll pull them up and I'll re repeat them properly. Now, for, for, um, for the audience to know, first off, the Bible didn't fall from the sky, as some people tend to think. And by the way, <laughs> those seven books that were removed are part of the Old Testament. Who is at fault for them being removed? I know, I know uh, Luther gets a ton of flack. Luther ultimately did not remove them, but Luther definitely is at fault because Luther is the very first one who trashes them the way they are trash, calls into question their inspiration, and rather than moving them, moves them to the back of his Bible. That, of course, even though technically he didn't remove them, that got the ball rolling because he no longer believed they were inspired. And later Protestants right afterwards did remove them because of how badly he had denigrated their status. I want to let the audience know every time the ancient church gathered, and I mean every time, there's not one time that didn't happen, that they gathered to talk about the list of the books of the Bible, those seven books were always there in the canon of Scripture. And when I talk about that, I mean Council of Rome 382, Hippo and Carthage, 393, 397. There's another one in, I think, 419, that, that date. I don't remember. It's 409 or 419. And there are many more throughout history where every time they gather and they talk about what is holy writ, they're included there, Elliot. So really the problem begins with Martin Luther. Now, the why? Because they teach Catholic doctrine. Hmm. Simple, as, simple enough. And, and we can go into what particularly they do teach that uh, horrified Luther, if you will. Yeah, I would be interested if you could pull out, you know, one or two of those things, because yeah. maybe they'll answer some of the questions as to why, um, you know, why we're in the place where we are right now, where there's so much confusion about the faith. Yeah. Now, in the beginning, Luther was very Catholic in his theology, even in his original protestations. In fact, uh, in Germany, if you go to the Church of Wittenberg and you look in the door and you look at the uh, the 95 Thesis, which the original is not there, of course, but they have, uh, they have it commemorated there in different areas of Protestant Germany. I want to be clear, not all Germany is Protestant. I go there very often. Bavaria is very still traditionally Catholic. Okay. Um, but um, the, you look at the 95 Thesis, and it's very Catholic. He's not denying purgatory. He's not denying anything other than attacking abuses that were happening. And if that is all Luther would have done, we would, have, we would applaud him. But that's not all Luther did. He tried to 
and he did change doctrine within his church. So he created a different counter church. And hmm. one particular teaching Luther did not like, and you could tell he really hated it because Luther had a problem with the fact that uh, he, he believed he was a wretched sinner, never good enough. So that played a huge part in his doctrine was sola fide, which means you are saved by faith alone. He hated purgatory. And he hated the fact that purgatory is clearly laid out in the book of two Maccabees. Thus, two Maccabees got trashed, but not only two Maccabees, multiple other books got trashed that emphasized good works. Shockingly enough, the New Testament book of James chapter two got trashed as well. And he really denigrated it, said it was an epistle of straw and it should be thrown into the oven. Uh, these are really shocking statements, Elliot. Statements said, you probably wouldn't find modern day evangelicals saying, but it's a legacy they carry with them. Interesting. So there are a lot of things uh, about the faith that um, are confusing to people. You brought up one just now. What exactly is purgatory and why do Catholics believe in it? Yeah. Now, purgatory is very simple. You know, sometimes people will say, well, are, is my loved one going to be in purgatory for a thousand years, two thousand years? We really don't know about the concept of time in the afterlife or whether time does operate the way it does here on earth. What we do know about purgatory is number one, very possible that in the afterlife and very likely you will need purification. You must be pure in order to enter into the kingdom of God as Revelation 21, 27 says, mm -hmm. nothing impure can enter heaven. That means not merely covering you, that means intrinsically, you've got to be pure. If you die in the grace of God, not in mortal sin, with still unrepentant sins on your soul, you will undergo that post-mortem, afterlife, purification before entering into the glory with our Lord. And that purification, we are told, is painful. It can take time. The fire in and of itself, we don't know if it's literal. The church has never defined if it's a literal fire or not. My personal opinion, Elliot, I think purgatory could differ varying on, depending on the person. Right. So we have great saints throughout history. Some of them believed in literal fire. Others believed in an instantaneous transformation. Neither of those are problematic. What we have to believe in, because it is biblical, is that it's very possible that if you don't have that purification here on earth, in the afterlife, you will be purified. And it's very clearly laid out in the Bible as well, in the Old and in the New Testament, I would add. So what do you say to those who uh, argue that as long as I believe in Jesus Christ, um, that I'm saved and that my faith alone gets me to heaven? Yeah, that, that really... It is an anti-biblical kind of theology there because if you look in Galatians 5, you read about how are you saved? By faith, but working. Your faith has got to be working through love. Everywhere you read, you read about a working faith coupled with works. In fact, in the very famous Romans 3.28, where it says that you are justified by faith, Without the works of the law, we can hardly say an amen to that. But the works of the law, we do not believe that we're performing those to enter heaven. We're no longer under the Mosaic law. We're under the law of Christ, as the Bible says. And thus, we must perform those works under the law of Christ, which really, it's the covenant of grace is what it is. But everywhere you read about it, and the pinnacle, pinnacle being in James 2, Eliot, where it tells you right there, you're, just, you're not justified by faith alone. The only area in the whole Bible where faith alone is used is to tell you that you're not justified by faith alone. You've got to supplement your faith with your works in order to be saved everywhere you read that. And our Lord in the Gospel of St. Matthew is very, very clear. Those that, that profess the name of the Lord, what is he going to do if they don't have... If they didn't do good works, they're going to go to eternal perdition. You've got to supplement your faith with good works. And in, indeed, Elliot, here is the one thing that should really shock people. 
Martin Luther added the word alone, allein, the German word, to Romans 3. What, what, a, what a legacy hmm. that I would not want my faith to have. I don't know if you knew that. He added a word to the Bible. And when the Catholics were furious, he said, well, I don't want to repeat the ugly word. He called them jackasses, to be nice. He said, when, they, when those jackasses question me, you tell them that Dr. Martin Luther is the one that authorized that word being added. He added that German word, Alain, to Romans 3.28, for it to read that one is justified by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. Well, if your theology is so evident in the Bible, why do you have to add a German word that was, I want to add, I own, by the way, I went through the trouble, Elliot. It was a great trouble of getting digital copies of every German Bible prior to Martin Luther. Traveled to Germany, got copies of all of them. Luther was the very first one to ever add that word. Now, if your theology is so present in the Bible, why do you have to add a German word that no German before you ever saw fit to add? I'll tell you why. Because his theology of sola fide is not present in the Bible. Amazing. So this is so good. And there's so much here to unpack. I'd like to take a few steps back. You and I are similar in that we were, well, for example, I wanted to know more about Western civilization and Western yep. faith. And so I discovered the early fathers of the church. I wasn't satisfied with the, you know, the, the typical churchish sort of ideas about Christ and, yep. and, um, and the faith. I wanted to go to the roots. I wanted to go to where it all began. You mentioned here that your vision is that everyone comes to a fuller understanding of the early church fathers. Yeah. Who are they and why are they important today? Yeah. Elliot, they played an incredible role with me becoming Catholic. They were, um, and, and we have a number of different um, eras in church history. We have the apostolic era, we have the patristic era, and we have the golden era of, um, of patristic theology. To break it down very simply, these are men and many women as well. There's some incredible women. By the way, women of today uh, take example of these amazing women back then. They're either men or women that were taught and trained by the apostles. And then later they taught their own disciples and on and on in an unbroken line. Now, people may say, well, William, how can you prove that? Well, we can prove it through the historical record through the enemies of the faith as well. But we can get to that later. One particular figure, incredible early church father, was Bishop Polycarp. He is an apostolic father from the first century, was martyred. He died for the faith. By the way, go read his amazing theology. Everything is Catholic on the face of it. He was taught and trained by the apostle St. John. But it doesn't end there. The apostolic succession continues because Bishop Polycarp taught and trained the great Saint Irenaeus. Saint John, Saint Polycarp, Saint Irenaeus, and in his magnificent work, The Fragments, Irenaeus recounts how he would listen to the preaching of the great Polycarp, how Polycarp knew the eyewitnesses. So we have an amazing testimony, hmm. not only to incredible apostolic succession, but to the bodily resurrection of our Lord. These early church fathers play an incredible role for knowing what the, what the apostles and our Lord taught. People today tell me, well, uh, well can you recommend a good Bible uh, commentary? By the way, there are some great Catholic ones out there. But I always tell them, go read the early church fathers. What better commentary than those that were taught and trained by the apostles? And by the way, when you read them, I tell you one thing, be careful because if you're Protestant, you're not going to remain Protestant. They believe things that we believe today as Catholic. Right. They believe the Holy Eucharist was the body and blood of our Lord. They believed in venerating Holy Mary. Mary was all immaculate. Prayer to the dead, prayer to the saints, venerating icons, and on and on. They were thoroughly Catholic. What do you say to people who argue that many of the things that Catholics believe, even though they may be coming from the fathers, are not biblical? That, yeah. comes, that comes about quite often. They'll say, that's not biblical. 
well, then why is it the Catholics believe it? Yeah. Now, that is a very common thing. Usually, you encounter that, Elliot, by people that, uh, and to be very respectful, are overwhelmed by the early church being thoroughly Catholic. They will say, well, in the Bible, people fell away from the faith. You know, couldn't these early figures fall away as well? Well, if you're going to argue that these early church fathers fell away from the faith and yet you're going to utilize the Bible that they put together, you're, you're in a little bit of a pickle there. Because you're, even though you may reject those seven books, you're utilizing the New Testament that they helped put together and put forth under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that is. But uh, the, the very simple answer would be, we don't believe... We don't believe and hold to sola scriptura, meaning everything we must believe must be right there in the Bible. That is not biblically based in and of itself. Number one, where on earth are you going to find the list of the books of the Bible in the Bible itself? Now, Elliot, I've had people tell me, well, you know, I feel that burning in the bosom where I feel that inspiration when I read a book of the Bible. Well, you know, uh, Joseph Smith did as well and all these other uh, cult founders of the faith you can't judge just based upon feeling alone and the protestants in, the, in an even bigger pickle elliot because if they're going to tell you well by reading the scripture i feel it is inspired well what do you do about the protestant version of the book of esther because in case the audience might not know the protestant version of the book of esther lacks any mention of god it is the only book in the whole bible where God is removed. Now, why was that done? Well, I want to be as nice as possible, but Luther was very anti-Jewish, did not like the Jews at all. And uh, the Jew and, the, and God appearing to vindicate the Jewish people towards the end of the book of Esther probably was something that Luther probably did not like. So in the Protestant version of the book of Esther, by the way, our evangelical friends, we don't dislike or hate you. We want you to come to the fools in faith. Open up your Bible when you're watching this. Look everywhere in the book of Esther, God will not appear in the Protestant book of Esther. He only appears in the fuller, complete Catholic edition. That is very problematic. You mentioned before we got on the call, your journey of coming to the fullness of faith in the Catholic church. Yeah. Again, you and I parallel in that we sought out the roots and yeah. as a result explored orthodoxy. Oh yeah. And so, I was very attracted to the Orthodox faith because of the patristic tradition. Uh, mm -hmm. I started to explore the sacraments, even though I was a, 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 a baptized Catholic as a kid, yep. fell away from the faith because my family fell away from faith, knew nothing of it, and then really started to uh, get a taste for the tradition mm -hmm. found in the Orthodox Church. What can you tell us about your decision not to be Orthodox and instead Catholic? Yeah. I can tell you that more than anything else, more than my comments in Protestantism and more than my comments in Islam, I ruffle the most feathers when I talk about orthodoxy. Because on, on my channel, uh, I, have, I even have orth orthodox mods on my channel, and I have a lot of very close friends that are Eastern Orthodox. But ultimately, uh, I did a very deep dive. I mean, look, the iconography in the Eastern churches is incredible, beautiful. They share a lot of our saints as well. We can talk everything we've said thus far, they can agree upon. Yeah. So, where, so at the end of the day, they'll then say, well, you know, William, but you know, what about all the problems in the church? And why not just go to orthodoxy? Right. Well, let me be very clear. If you think that there's only problems within the Catholic church, there are a ton in Eastern Orthodoxy as well. Mm. You're always going to encounter problems where there are flawed, fallen human beings right. what you've got to examine are the dogmas the doctrines of the church and ultimately two things were major deciding factors for me the papacy which is strongly rooted in scripture papal primacy which is strongly in scripture and the early church and then mariology within eastern orthodoxy the fact that they have abandoned the belief that Holy Mary was immaculately conceived is to me a major problem, considering all of the Eastern, the great Eastern saints, those giants that they hold today as incredible saints, they taught and they believed it. Yet today they've moved away from it because mm. they believe it to be too Latin. Those two particular things 
perhaps, well, actually not perhaps, definitely were the major driving points of moving me towards Catholicism. And today, I don't regret the decision at all. In fact, I think maybe uh, uh, almost a year ago now, I debated a good friend of mine. He is an Eastern Orthodox scholar and priest. And I debated him on the topic of the Immaculate Conception. And I am fully convinced even today that these two teachings I listed, there are others perhaps, but these two are crucial ones that made me say I need to become Catholic because Catholicism is the only fullness of the faith. So let's explore that for a moment, uh, especially in terms of Mary. I'd like to come back to the papacy in a moment, but one of the questions that's typically asked is, why is it that Catholics worship Mary? What's that all about? Yeah, typically you have a very unfortunate and distorted understanding of what worship is. So number one, in the Bible, the, the Greek word for worship is latruo, uh, or in Latin, latria, uh, latrevo, depending on what kind of a Greek you, you want to pronounce it, uh, whether modern or, or, or what kind of Greek is utilized. Let's stick with the Latin, latria. Mm -hmm. That's a, that is the word for worship. That is worship given to God and God alone. So if you worship Mary or a saint, you are committing idolatria. Very simple. Then there is another Greek word for veneration. Two Greek words, actually. You can utilize proskuneo or you can utilize dulio, dulia. Either of those. Proskuneo is typically bowing, prostrating. Dulio is typically religious reverence you give to a holy person. Now, in the Bible, of course, you're going to utilize proskuneo and dulio for God. Of course, because you honor and venerate God. But primarily, you give God latria, because that is worship to God and God alone. But the Bible is also very clear. You can give veneration to holy people. What we give Mary is called hyperdulia, because we believe Mary to have been the greatest creation of God. And we can talk about how the Bible does lay that out. So biblically, if you realize the Bible does distinguish between worship and veneration, and we're told that you can and you should venerate people that are holy. The book of Galatians is very clear about that. Why is there a problem with venerating Holy Mary? They see us bowing, but in the Bible, you can bow to people that are holy or people in high honor. And that is not always worship. So biblically, there's nothing wrong with honoring and venerating those that are in high service, that are due high service, people that are holy. Biblically, there's nothing wrong with that, which is why the early church did that. I think the main hang-up will be Protestants will eventually say, okay, but why do you call Mary all holy and deserving of that kind of honor? And of course, then that does open it up to a whole other discussion. So, well, that would be a good discussion, but yeah. also, too, there are a lot of Marian dogmas uh -huh. that some may argue are unbiblical. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, her immaculate conception or that she w never had any other children, mm -hmm. um, things of this yeah. nature. What do you say to someone who says, for example, that uh, Mary, Mary uh, was not a virgin or that she had other children? Yeah. Number one, I, I believe that uh, the idea of Mary being perpetual virgin is incredibly strongly attested to in the Bible. Number two, before we, we hop into that, and I'll break that down, uh, here's an incredible truth. We'll blow the audience away. If you look into the early church, and I don't mean heretics that were condemned by the church, I mean those that believed Christ was God, believed in the Trinity, people that were church fathers all throughout church history, they were unanimous that Holy Mary was i.e. Parthenos. In the Greek, that means perpetual virgin. Why do they believe that? In Luke 1, when the angel enters to greet Holy Mary, and Mary and says, Kairi uh, kecharitomene, hail, having been filled with grace, or hail, full of grace. Literally, Greek scholars say you can translate that as full of grace, and you should. 
Mary's incredulous response to her about to have a child when she says, I know not, how can this be? I know not man. And many other Greek words there might strike us as English readers as, hmm, how can Mary not know how she's going to have a child? You know, she knows the normal functions and what have you, and the angel just told her this, and, you know, she just got it laid out for her. But that was is not the point of Luke laying it out the way he does. What is happening there is perhaps a little complex. In the early church fathers, they viewed Mary's words there as indicative of a vow. How, do you, how can you even prove that? Well, the words that Holy Mary quotes are only quoted in one other area in all of Scripture. That's in the book of Judges, chapter 11. Who quotes those words? A perpetually vowed virgin. It was Jephthah's daughter who ends up dying a perpetually vowed virgin, and she's quoting those exact words. Now, here's a really cool thing that we did when we were working on our book on Mary. Uh, I, I co-authored the book with, the, in my opinion, uh, the top Mariologist in the world, my dear friend, Father Coppice, who, by the way, just, just presented at Oxford on Mariology. And we have, he has access, because he's a scholar, to what is called the TLG. That is the Thesaurus Lingue Grece. When you plug in certain words there, it will show you how those words are used all throughout history in the Greek language. The words utilized by Mary are parallel, only found there in Judges 11. That is indicative of the vow Holy Mary has taken, and the early church also recognizes that, hmm. which is exactly why, Elliot, no church father ever believes Mary ever had any children. And we could talk about how we know that, even though the brothers and sisters are named, we could talk about that if you want, but uh, though that, that in and of itself, to me is mind-blowing, but that is confirmed by numerous scholars, not only us. We just did a show with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Sebastian Brock. By the way, he's not a Catholic, and he's a Greek and a Syriac scholar, and he said, oh yeah, those words are indicative of a vow. Those words are paralleled only in the perpetually vowed virgin of Jephthah's daughter. That is why Holy Mary is uttering those words. She was a perpetually vowed virgin as well. What do you say to people who argue that all this focus on Mary uh, is a distraction from Jesus? Yeah. I hear that very often, Elia. What I think more than anything else is that focusing on Mary gives all honor and glory to Christ. Now, why would that be? Every Marian dogma points to our Lord, the great things that our Lord did for Holy Mary. Indeed, if anybody ever says, well, how can you continuously give this honor to Mary? In the very first prophecy of the Bible, in Genesis 3, the prophecy there of the future Messiah to come, the mother is also mentioned there. Now, Protestants will disagree exactly what that means, but we will agree that the woman and the seed of the woman are Mariological and they are Messianic. In the very first prophecy of the coming Messiah, if the Messiah is mentioned right there with his mother, that tells you how significant a role Holy Mary will play. And every kind of honor we give Mary, we talk about Mary being perpetual virgin, it's a wonderful thing because it gives all honor and glory to God. She serves God and God alone all her days. If we talk about Mary being mother of God, the Greek word is Theotokos, she's the God-bearer. It's honor to God. If we talk about the Immaculate Conception, it's about, as the Pope Pius IX said, that singular grace given to Mary by Christ. Nothing Mary merited. It's from God. Even the bodily assumption is to give all honor and glory to God because of the great things he's done not only for Mary, Mary was first there, but what he's going to do for all of us, his creation, the love he has for us. Every Marian dogma points directly to God. So I can 
wrap my mind around that. I think some people might be able to understand. One of the ways I sort of look at it is if I was God and I was going to incarnate, I would choose a perfect <laughs> woman, right? If you're going to make your own mom, think about it. I'm going to make my own mom. I'm going to make a pretty amazing woman, immaculate woman. So, oh yeah. but what about all this saint worship? Like, who are these saints? Why are they saints? And then why, once again, maybe not worship, but venerate, pay attention to all these other guys when all we need is Jesus? Yeah, that, that is a great, great question. And, and to really sum it up, our Lord wants us to give veneration to others. If it we're told all over Scripture that intercession is a good thing, we're following the commandments of our Lord, the mandates of our Lord. And then there is an area in the New Testament, because we can talk about the Old Testament very often, those books that are removed that show saintly intercession. But we don't have to go into those disputed books. We can stick with the book of Revelation chapter 5, where there are people here on earth, they're praying, and their prayers are received in Revelation 5, 8, by those glorified saints in heaven. Now, what do they do with those prayers? They present them to the Lamb, and they bow down to the Lamb, presenting the prayers to the Lord. Now, people will then say, well, you know, there's no evidence that they knew what the prayer said. Well, it's very definitely implied there. But even if you want to take that position that they don't know what the prayer is saying, this is saintly intercession. They're receiving the prayers as bowls of incense, and they're bowing down, worshiping God and presenting the prayers to God. That there is saintly intercession. The book of Hebrews tells us we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. It's talking about those that are in the other life already. Everywhere you look, we read about in, in 1 Timothy 2, giving honor, intercession, petitions to those that are holy, those in high honor. So everywhere you look in the Bible, you read about this being a biblical practice. And why wouldn't it be, Elliot, if we're told literally in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and everywhere else, that death doesn't cut you off from our Lord. You're more alive. In fact, there's a Greek word used about Abraham and others that are dead. That Greek word is zao, which literally means they're perpetually living. They're alive in heaven. They're not cut off and kind of asleep. That is very powerful. Well, then who gets to determine who becomes a, a saint? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. Early on in early church history, those great martyrs and those apostolic early church fathers, those are saints that were assumed to have been saints already by the apostolic churches because of the great virtue they had and the way they died and the way they were martyred for the faith. You didn't get this kind of uh, decision making until much later in history. And that comes exclusively from the magisterium. There are many saints that we do share with Eastern Orthodoxy, for instance, the great Augustine, Jerome, many saints we all share before what we call the schism. Here's what people may not know. There are three ancient apostolic churches, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and the Syriac Orthodox. People tend to forget the Syriac Orthodox. Mm -hmm. we sch they schism from us. We had that break from the Syriac before the Eastern Orthodox. That happened in the fifth century. Um, they are very similar to us, so very similar like the Eastern Orthodox. And when we say these are ancient apostolic, we mean they are ancient and apostolic, but we hold firmly that the fullness of that apostolicity is only found within the Catholic faith. So a lot of saints are shared between the Catholic, the Syriac, and the Eastern Orthodox. But later saints would definitely be decided by the magisterium by a number of things, such as are there verifiable miracles that can be verified? Research is definitely done. And I really do think it is a very, very good and wholesome process. I only wish some of those great saints would um, be made or be put into sainthood much faster. But hey, I'm not the Pope, so <laughs> I don't have the, that kind of decision making. But I do know that this, in my, if anybody loves Mary, if anyone loves Mary and they want a devotion to an incredible saint, this is my favorite. If you ever want to talk about a manly guy, a real hero, the great blessed Duns Scotus. 
He was the greatest Marian defender ever. Died very young, unfortunately, but was a great defender of the Immaculate Conception of Holy Mary. And the thing, here's the thing, Elliot. Some people may be listening and say, well, I don't know who that is. That's because we have so many incredible saints in the faith. You mentioned, you, you used a word just now, magisterium. First, yeah. I'd, I'd love for you to describe what the magisterium is. Yes. Uh, and then, well, I'll follow up after that. Yes. Typically, people, to not get confused, it is our living and breathing teaching authority that we have. We believe that our councils, ecumenical councils, when dealing with faith and morals, cannot err because they are guided by the Holy Spirit. So we have 21 ecumenical councils. I know some people may come back and say, well, William, what are you talking about? How can they not err? Some of them are talking about trivial things like hunting and, and parties uh, or what have you. We're talking about dogmatically things that deal with faith and morals. The Council of Nicaea dealt with the divinity of our Lord and Savior. Uh, the Council of Ephesus dealt with Holy Mary as Mother of God, as Teotokos. When we're talking about that, that is what we mean. It is a living teaching authority of the church. And we believe that our church, you can have, and we do have, unfortunately, you can have rotten people. We've had very bad popes throughout history. <laughs> and we've had some incredible ones as well. It just tends to be that people focus on the really bad ones. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had some great ones throughout history. I've, I've had people tell me, you know, William, I, I can't stand our current hierarchy and what have you. And at times I'm not the biggest fan either, but we've had some really, really bad ones throughout history. But the one thing that never does happen, Elliot, is that the magisterium never goes off course and changes Catholic dogma. That has never happened. You're never going to have a pope or you're never going to have a council gather and then say, we got it wrong. Purgatory is not real. Or we got it wrong. Sola fide is acceptable in the Protestant sense or any of these kinds of teachings within the Catholic faith, dogma will never change. And that to me is something you can really lay your hat upon. And I can sleep comfortably at night knowing that. <laughs> yeah, there's some sense of uh, order. So what do you say to people who argue that there's no need for a church hierarchy, these councils and magisterium yeah. and all of this is unnecessary and I just need a relationship with Christ or a yeah. relationship with God the Father? Yeah, you hear that often, Elliot, and, and I think the biggest problem is the canon of Scripture. Number one, where on earth do you derive it from if you don't have any kind of connection to Catholicism? Even if you, you try to say, well, you know, I, I don't accept those seven books, you accept the New Testament. And it was the living and teaching authority of the church that rejected books like the Gospel of Thomas uh, and other, the Gospel of Peter and other pseudonymous fake gospels. And it was the living teaching magisterium that said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are authentic. They are apostolic. They are inspired. So just by that, it shows you, you need a magisterium. You need a living teaching church. Otherwise, how are you going to make those decisions that the gospel of Peter or any of these other gospels are not holy? I'll, I'll add one other thing. People may come back and say, well, William, you know, some of these Gospels are ridiculous. Of course they were rejected. Yeah, but what do you do about the letter of, uh, of Clement of Rome to the Corinthians or the Shepherd of Hermas or the Epistle of Barnabas or many others that they sound incredibly holy? You would be confused. In fact, Elliot, I would be willing to bet money. I've done it before where I've handed over one of these apocryphal Gospels to an evangelical, said, read a couple of chapters. Tell me what you think. And they've read them. They said, what book of the Bible is this? And it hasn't been a book of the Bible. You need that living and teaching authority for these kinds of decisions. That's incredibly important. Now, there are others as well. There are multiple others. This is why, Elliot, within Protestantism, there is an incredible fracturing. I can go down the street and I can encounter a Protestant church where they deny infant baptism. 
then I can go across the other street and walk into one where they hold to it. And both of them claim to be Bible-based. Well, who's correct and who's wrong? Ultimately, it is the church that Christ founded that is going to be able to have that power to decide. And how can we prove that it is the Catholic Church? Well, biblically, we can prove it because of the office of the papacy. We see that office, not foreshadowed, promised in Matthew 16, and we see that come to its fulfillment in the Gospel of St. John, where our Lord tells Peter that he will be the shepherd. The Greek word is poimine. He will shepherd the flock. Well, I want to ask our evangelical friends, where is your St. Peter that is shepherding your flock? Because the promise of that office didn't end with Peter, Eliot. We're told in the book of Acts chapter 1 that whenever the office of bishop becomes vacant, and it uses the Greek word episcopate for bishop, it must be filled. And the Catholic Church has, in perpetuity, fulfilled the office of bishop. And we would ask our Protestant friends, where is your apostolic succession? Where is your St. Peter? And we don't literally mean Francis is St. Peter. It's a, meta, it's a way of speaking, of saying he is the successor of St. Peter. So uh, I want to broaden that out a little bit to sort of draw in this anti-authority sentiment that is so prevalent. Yeah. What, is, what do you say to people who say, all oh, this is unnecessary? I don't need religion. And so I hear this from a lot of Christians. They'll say, no, I... I just have a relationship with Christ. I don't need religion. And I'll say, well, you're, then you're Protestant. And they'll argue, no, I'm not even Protestant. I just don't need religion, but I, but I just need Christ. And you could go one step further in those who are spiritual. My question is, why do we need all this? Yeah. When we look at the Bible, and even if we, if, if we want to step outside the Bible for a moment, if you yeah. will, for people that are merely spiritual. Right. And maybe they don't view the Bible as being inspired. What, what cannot be denied, what the evidence is incredibly powerful for, is that, number one, there was a historical man that lived, Jesus of Nazareth. Historically, we know he lived, he was crucified, he was killed, he died on the cross. The enemies of the faith all attest to this. And... We know, even if you don't want to look at the Bible as an inspired record, there is tons of testimony, not only in the scripture, but in these post-scriptural writings that we call apostolic era, of the fact that that man that was crucified and died was seen physically alive again. Now, if anybody knows anything about Roman crucifixions, they would not leave anybody alive (laughs) on that cross they would die even if as modern day liberal scholars and muslims like to say they'll say well it's only in the gospel of john we read about him being speared that doesn't matter because you have multiple enemies of the faith attesting to the fact that this man died you're not going to be crucified and survive that he died on the cross Then he was physically seen alive. If we look at all of that evidence and we view that as incredibly strong in a historical fashion, Elliot, we tell these people that are merely spiritual that we believe if that man's message that he was going to bodily resurrect is true and we can prove it historically, then we have to look at everything else that man, Jesus of Nazareth, said. And when we look at everything else he said, it leads you to believe he did indeed found a church. He founded a church that was thoroughly Catholic. And we urge our friends that are merely spiritual, that don't think you need any of this kind of religion, to look at the church that that historical figure did found. And we don't ask them to say, well, Everybody within this church must be holy and without blemish and without error. No, there are, we're talking about spiritual, even spiritual people. If you don't want to talk about mankind being fallen, flawed, definitely not perfect. You're going to encounter a lot of those kinds of people in this church. But ultimately, 
what we must hold fast to, and we must hold fast to at the very threat of society becoming completely degenerate, are those conservative teachings taught by that church. And I think that is a very wholesome kind of way of looking at things. Of course, it does require a lot of historical research, but I am fully convinced, Elliot, that when you look at the greatest arguments an atheist or a spiritual non-believer can put forth, when you look at them, you compare them to the evidence of Catholicism and the historical case for the historical Christ. I think they're going to be convinced of the historical Christ. Amazing. Thank you. So I'm sorry if that was long-winded. What's that? I'm sorry if that was long-winded there, brother. (laughs) All all of your questions are (laughs) (laughs) long-winded. That's what this is right now. It's the long wind of William Albrecht. And that's okay. I'm enjoying it. it. And I mean, it keeps me on my toes because every other word out your mouth, I'm writing, jotting down. I'm like, oh, we can go down that rabbit hole, that rabbit hole, that rabbit hole. And so I'm trying to, I'm sort of, trying to figure out what rabbit hole I want to go down next. And I literally Anything. have a, an Anything. entire page of questions here and we've, we've just scratched the, <laughs> the surface. So, man, I want to keep this sort of, sort of superficial, if you will, like, because yeah. I want to go deep in some of the things that you're saying, but I do have some questions here, which are very common. A lot of people will ask me or, uh, you know, that they're, they're typical when you're, uh, faced with someone who's confused about the faith. So yeah. I'd like to kind of, I don't want to say rapid fire, but I'd like to go down the line here and just get your insight on some of these. Uh, yeah. Number one, why is it that Catholics eat Jesus? We yeah. believe that in that piece of bread, there is Christ. What's mm-hmm. that about? Yeah, we believe the, we believe the words of our Lord that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, we find in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 26, and we find in John chapter 6, very especially there, we believe the words when our Lord says, this is my body, this is my blood. We truly believe that the elements change, they become the body and the blood of Christ. So when we talk about eating our Lord, we don't, and here's the one thing that I need to be very careful about, excuse me, We don't mean it in a carnal manner. Now, what do we mean by that? We don't mean we're literally grabbing Christ and biting off his flesh. We believe it becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. That is exactly what we're consuming. Now, people will then say, well, William, there there are some early church fathers that call this spiritual. 100%. But spiritual doesn't mean symbolic. There's a very big difference. It truly is our Lord. And that Greek word for spiritual and the Latin word for spiritual, they never mean symbolic. So we got to be very careful, though. We do advocate it is spiritual, but spiritual does not mean symbolic. It truly is. It really is the body and blood of our Lord. We believe that because the Bible says it. I really like that distinction between symbolic and spiritual because it gives you pause to say, okay, then what is it? Uh, I loved hearing Bishop Barron. He did a YouTube video not too long about this. And he put it this way. This really satisfied it for me. He said that if a police, if I walk into your house and I say, hey, William, you're under arrest. (laughs) You'd look at me and you'd laugh. I'm like, well, you you have no authority to say that. Your words are powerless. But if a officer dressed in the uniform of the state walks in and says, William, you are under arrest. Whether you believe it or not, your reality just changed. You are literally under arrest (laughs) in that moment. And so is the same with the Eucharist. Christ in his authority says, and his uh, bishops, his, uh, his, his ministers, through their authority given to them by him say that this is a transubstantiated uh, reality, a a changed reality. And in that authority, it literally is. Why is it we would give the, why do it give the authority to the state to change our reality, but not to Christ? That, That I think Elliot is a great, great point there. Why would anyone deny the very clear words of our Lord 
And to add to that, here's another mind-blowing thing that really blew me away and helped me become Catholic was when I looked at the early church in the 90s, 100s, two, three, four, five, six, every era of church history, every single early church father believed that. They believed it truly became the body and blood of Christ. You will never encounter, not even one, you're never going to Google it and say, uh-oh, well, William, William lied to me. You're never going to encounter one that says this is merely symbolic. You never will. You'll encounter them like Augustine that'll say this is spiritual. And then the very next sentence will tell you it truly is the body and blood of Christ because spiritual does not mean symbolic. And I've got to say, the Eucharist is, it is beautiful. I invite everybody, study the Catholic faith, and you're going to be incredibly blown away. And, and the beauty that is occurring there at Mass, look. And you cover uh, yeah, it in this book. We cover it in depth. You know, there's one thing about that book that really, and it was, it was my idea. So if my friend Father Coppin sees it, he's, he's going to know I'm not lying. When we were writing that book, I said, Father, what if I tried to get a hold of an Eastern Orthodox scholar and a Syriac Orthodox scholar, and they wrote chapters with us to confirm that all of the apostolic churches believe in the Holy Eucharist becoming the body and blood of Christ. And that is exactly what we did. We have two chapters from them in there. And we trace how all of the early church were unanimous. Now, there are a lot of really good books in the Eucharist, but very few that talk about the actual transubstantiation. Ours is devoted completely to that. And I've got to say, Elliot, uh, all honor and glory to God, because that is what we're doing when we're there at the Holy Mass. I'll be honest, uh, I've been to some Masses where there's incredible preaching, and then I've been to some very boring preaching. I don't care about the preaching. Right. I to attend the banquet of our Lord. That is what I want. That's so fascinating. That's one of the things that drew me back into the faith was the reverence yeah. of the mass yes. because of the sacrifice that we are participating in. You know, bouncing around early in my, in my faith search, I found myself at these very exciting, elaborate concerts for Jesus. Yep. And something in me just, it felt, you know, people will say cringy. There's just something cringed about it inside me because I'm like, you're al almost trying to take something that is divine in nature, something that yeah. should require reverence and, and silence and yeah. turning it into a, a party. So the whole, so everybody's invited and it's all fun and we're going to have a great old time. It just rubbed me the wrong way. The day I yeah. walked back into a Catholic parish, which I hadn't been in for maybe two decades or longer, I instantly felt the sense of dignity and yeah. reverence for what was happening there. And it wasn't about me getting entertained or they would say fed, but although I yeah. am being fed because I'm consuming the body and blood of my Lord, but Amen. not being uh, entertained by elaborate or, or, or uh, inspiring fun homilies it was there to be humbled in the presence of the lord that 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 truly to me uh it, it takes me back elliot to the very first mass that i attended and i'll never forget um <clears throat> i was ba i barely made the decision to become catholic by the way <laughs> when i had in my mind i fought it for the longest time elliot i continued going to the protestant church until one day i said I can't do it anymore. I cannot in yeah. good conscience do it anymore. I, um, I went to a local parish and I just sat in the back in awe, in awe of the beauty because mm -hmm. I, I knew what was happening, knew what was going on, in awe of the beauty, just blown away. And, and really, I, I agree with you. These uh, loud concerts and what have you, they're not for me. And <laughs> I'd like to add to the audience, if you look in the Bible, or anywhere throughout church history, the mass is reverence. Yeah. It's reverent. It's beautiful. Yeah. I'd recommend anybody. The first thing that comes to my mind, I want the audience to be blown away. You can find this online for free. Type in Cyril of Jerusalem, Catechetical Lecture 23. Look at the year that was written in. Read that. 
and you will imagine that you're at a Catholic mass today. If that doesn't blow you away, I don't know what will. It's a Catholic mass right there. Purgatory, praise for the dead, the holy sacrifice of the mass, on and on and on. What an incredible ancient testimony that our faith has. And that to me, Elliot, is something that no other faith can, can replicate. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. One of the things you notice right away when you go into a Catholic church that's different than your Protestant church is all of the paintings, mm -hmm. the saints. We went to a, a, a church in, uh, it was uh, St. Bernadette's in Arizona this weekend. Yeah. And the ceilings were painted with depictions of the of the life of Christ, you know, his his passion, his his resurrection, Mary, all of that. It was just beautiful everywhere. Statues. I mean, you walk in there and you feel like you're you're going to heaven. You're in heaven. But what do you say to people that then argue that well, all of that is idol worship? Why yeah. are you praying to that statue or? Or, or, or venerating that icon. These are these are uh, pagan practices. What's going on there? Yeah. The, number one, it really it really does come from a very gross misrepresentation or misinterpretation of the commandments. Number one, uh, when it ta talks about no graven image being made, it's very clearly talking about idolatry. There. Now, it doesn't mean that you can never make a graven image. If that were the case, Elliot, we wouldn't have graven images being made and being made by the command of God right afterwards. If they are evil in and of themselves, how could the bronze serpent have been made? How could images such as those on the Ark of the Covenant be ordered by God hmm. if images are evil and if it is idolatry? But then people are going to say, well, you know, okay, but we're talking about images in churches. Where's that in the Bible? You can find it in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 44. It is a vision that occurs in Ezekiel 44, the idealized vision of the temple. And there are carved cherubim in the temple of God. This is the idealized temple, carved imagery right there in the area of worship, hmm. in the temple of God. So if anybody says, well, why, why, can, uh, why do Catholics have images of saints? Well, within ancient Judaism, images were very prevalent. In the book of Ezekiel, they are prevalent there as well. The next argument that they will put forth, Elliot, will be, well, but, but you, know, you guys are venerating them. We're not venerating marble or statue. We're venerating what is represented, the holy figure. And biblically, we are allowed to give veneration to holy individuals. They've won their crown already. As 1 Corinthians 9, 27 says, they've run the race. They've gotten their crown. They're in heaven, they're in glory. We're giving them honor. We're not worshiping them. And we are allowed to have images. And I'd like to add one other thing, Elliot. We look in early church history, in the 100s, in the 200s as well, there are examples of images being used by the early church. Now, if anyone ever says, Elliot, well, well, William, well, Elliot, where are the examples of these elaborate, beautiful churches in the 100s? The church was on the run in the 100s, being martyred and being murdered. They didn't have time to sit down and set up a church, especially because Christianity was illegal until the time of the Emperor Constantine. You could not legally be a Christian. So, of course, you're not going to have tons of elaborate churches. But here's the amazing thing. For anybody looking... Google Dura Europas, an ancient church replete with imagery, a, a church that was definitely hidden from the public because it had images in there. It is from the 200s, and there is Christian iconography present there. I got to say that it, it is the iconography that played a huge part in my reversion as well. I could, yeah. and a lot of it, just to be completely transparent, was... Uh, I guess you would say Eastern Orthodox in nature. I know there was a lot, there were a lot of imagery that comes out of Constantinople and, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, 
And so I was very drawn to this imagery. I, would, I bought a book with icons and I would just sit there and I would, I, would, I would be drawn into it. Now, I know the faith. One of the things I discovered about the faith is it's, I don't want to say hyper, but, but strong focus on being rational rather than emotional. Yep. But yeah. I couldn't help to notice that I'm emotion. I was emotionally attached to these yeah. uh, to these pictures, and they almost would help my prayer or 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 help my meditation. And so there's yep. some sort of power to it. There, there really, truly is there, Elliot. There's an incredible uh, ability to be able to connect, if you will, with these amazing figures. I remember. When I got my very first icon of Holy Mary, and, and it was a very reverent, very simple kind of icon, but that really is what a lot of these icons are. They're beautiful, but then if you look at the figures, they're simple people, but that is the whole point. Yeah. Our Lord <laughs> picked the humble, the simple, the lowly, and you raised them. Uh, Peter was a, was a fisherman. A lot of these men were illiterate, were, were poor, uh, and Holy Mary, we're told, was a, a lowly handmaid. And this lowly handmaid, we're told in Scripture, is the greatest of God's creations. We're, she is called, literally, the Greek is in the vocative. The, the angel greets her in a titular fashion as full of grace. By the way, that Greek word for grace, gecharitomene, the root word there, keratao, is found in Ephesians 1. The kind of grace that Mary is in full possession of is the kind of grace that is described as sinless, spotless. I mean, the way our Holy Mother is described to me, I could never, ever return to Protestantism or ever abandon the faith because of the beauty laid out in Scripture and then the beauty that all of these early followers of this historical figure of Christ went to their martyrdom for. They were told, Eliab, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, renounce your Lord and you'll live. But they chose to be ripped apart by lions. I mean, I, I wish I could have just a, a, a fraction of that incredible faith that they had. And we need to have that kind of faith today, mm -hmm. especially because uh, society is getting bad, worse, and terrible. You've got to have the, you've got to be on fire for your faith. You have to be on fire to preserve conservative values because people are trying to knock those down. And they will come for the churches. They will come for what is upholding the truth. And that truth was laid out by our Lord. There's so, there's so much to unpack there. There's, there's so much <laughs> that I'd like to run with. But I, I want to take a step back for a moment and, and talk again about the papacy and the yeah. Vatican. And so this week uh, in one of my forums, uh, the conversation was around this perhaps some people believe satanic symbolism that is present in the Vatican they say that there's this snake-like serpent styled building and that I mean and some of the stuff does look creepy just to be in my yeah. opinion I'm looking at like behind the Pope yeah. and whatever this stuff is I'm like yeah it is it is kind of creepy yeah well what what is what is first of all what is that all about but then how do we reconcile that with people that then assert that the catholic church is satanic yeah. and that there's uh there there are satanic things going on in there there are pagan rituals and that the vatican is the seat of the antichrist that's a big ball of yeah. wax but it, it all kind of points to the same idea that the faith is uh, from satan yeah uh, you hear that very often. Number one, when touching upon uh, some of these rooms in the Vatican, uh, I'm going to echo it with you. I don't think they look good. <laughs> I don't think they look nice. Um, but unfortunately, well, fortunately, uh, the serpent room is taken and it's distorted very much so with a fish lens. It doesn't look diabolical. When, through natural photography, it doesn't look diabolical. At worst, it's an ugly room, and it is. <laughs> I, I don't like it. And then the 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 other um, the other uh, it look it does look like a serpent. Uh, this figure behind the Pope. Mm -hmm. But if you notice that, that's not a serpent. If you notice a photo that has not been doctored or messed with, it is a resurrected Christ. And the imagery 
uh, I see, I'm trying to remember, I believe it's a representative of the resurrected Christ through kind of like a nuclear blast or something. It's representative of, of, yeah. of anti-war. I, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it doesn't look even remotely like a serpent. Um, and I have had people tell me, well, this is incredibly beautiful. I don't like it. <laughs> I personally don't. Right. But uh, whether I like it or not doesn't mean it's diabolical. Right. It is not diabolical. Now, touching upon the other thing, uh, there is no evidence of any rituals, anything satanic, or any of the sort going on in the Vatican. But then people will then say, well, there have there been bad people, bad bishops, bad priests. And I echo that, those sentiments of being upset at that. There are still bad bishops and bad priests in the church. We need to get together, pray that they get removed, pray they get reported, pray they get found out for the bad things they're doing, and get them the heck out of there. There are a lot of bad ones, but they are a ton of great ones out there. I think of Bishop Strickland. I think of a number of incredible priests. By the way, next week, I'll be meeting with my good friend, Bishop Strickland. I will be meeting with him, and we're going to be talking about Holy Mary and the Holy Eucharist. He's a great bishop, but there are some bad ones in the church and i want to be very clear bad people doesn't mean that the whole church is corrupt the whole church is evil it doesn't mean that at all and by the way pope francis for as much as people don't like pope francis pope francis has never taught heresy i want to be very clear and for the audience that are probably going to reply and say well we don't like pope francis or what have you i am biased I uh, was a fan of Benedict Moore because Benedict was a theologian. I'm not a huge fan of Pope Francis, but not being a huge fan doesn't mean the guy is diabolical or evil. Uh, I just, uh, I prefer other popes. I prefer other popes. And I wish Francis was a little clearer in some of the stuff he says as well. I do, but that doesn't mean that the Catholic institution in and of itself is diabolical or demonic. I don't have, there is no evidence of that. Although I do know the claims of Freemasonry and what have you, by the way, for people that may be wondering, and in the future, I can even get you some great guests to come on here to talk about how they were in the past part of Freemasonry, and they will give incredible testimony and they will say, this is diabolically evil, but they, none of them are going to say that the Freemasons or these satanic cults have infiltrated the heart of the Vatican. Those are merely conspiracies interesting okay that's another can of worms you know we were talking about the enemies you've, you've, you've used that term a number of times enemies of the faith let's yep. open that up for a moment so what who are freemasons and why yeah. are they claim why do some people claim and and is it true that they're enemies of the church yeah well i'll be very clear i don't know a whole lot about what goes on within the Freemasonry, which is why I'm thrilled that I'm going to be, begin doing a number of shows with a few individuals that were in the higher tiers of Freemasonry, were experts on that. I do know, though, that Freemasonry has been condemned. It has been officially condemned by the church as cultic in and of itself because of the kind of vows that the people within Freemasonry are required to take. Now, I have seen some of these vows being very anti-Christian, being very anti-Catholic in particular. So that much I do know is a fact about Freemasonry. As far as how diabolical or how evil it can get, that I am definitely ignorant to. But I do know that it really is a movement that popes have been condemning for quite some time now. You cannot be a Freemason and be a Catholic. The church has been very clear about that. So there's a lot to unpack there in terms of how the church has changed over the years. Now, I have come across this idea that the church was infiltrated. Right. And that uh, this happened in the 1950s. By the 1960s, yeah. we had Vatican II. And it was yeah. at Vatican II that a lot of these Freemasonic ideas began to take hold, which yeah. basically turned the church away from it, particularly the mass. I've read a lot of Father Gruner's stuff. Um, yeah. 
how the how the liturgy had changed and then opened the way for a lot of the wokeism that we experience in the church today. Not exactly sure where I want to begin, but I, I do want to point to and, and allow you to elaborate on what happened there. And then now there seems to be a split in the church where there are those who, uh, I, I don't know if you could call them liberal Catholics, um, yeah. but more Vatican II type woke Catholics. And then there's this traditionalist movement where you have a lot of like the Pope pious societies and things yeah. of that nature. What's going on there? Okay, so there are other there are others as well. And, um, there are other groups as well that uh, just flat out deny Vatican II or want Vatican II completely removed. Now, I take a very uh, balanced approach. I understand the concerns of those that say, hey, what the heck is going on uh, after Vatican II? What has happened after Vatican II? But the one thing that I do not agree with, and I, I know that a lot of these people, uh, a lot of these people that have remained traditionally minded, I know they don't assert that Vatican II was a false council, but I don't think Vatican II was a false council. What I do think happened was a lot of liberalism did creep in to the sense that what Vatican II laid out did not get implemented in the proper fashion. Because if you read what Vatican II says about the Mass, right. what it says about, and by the way, I'm, um, I want to be very clear, uh, there are so many beautiful Masses. I love the traditional Latin Mass. I love the Byzantine liturgy. But don't get me wrong, there are a lot of very reverent Novus Ordo Masses. Yes. People, really, the Novus Ordo gets trashed a lot, but there's some incredibly reverent and beautiful ones. I can tell people that right here in Texas, there's some amazing ones across the border where I, I, I oftentimes I go and I give talks. There are incredibly beautiful ones there as well. What happened was the fail to implement what Vatican II's vision was. Liberalism became rampant all over the world and did it creep into many churches? Without a doubt it did. That's why we have so many abuses that blew up. Of course, liberalism crept in, but liberalism didn't creep into the council was the point. The idea that you had and I know the arguments of Bunigny and all these characters they claimed right. uh, tried to remove the sacrificial elements. None of that happened. Those are really completely conspiracy driven. The Ooh. council in and of itself, the council Vatican II is very well. And I just did a show, by the way, if people want to see, I just did a show about a week ago with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Fastigi. We cover all of Vatican II. But Dr. Fastigi is not your regular kind of guy. He is the guy that actually translated all of Denzinger. Now, if anybody knows who Denzinger, what that is, those are all the decrees of all the councils. The guy is one of the top scholars in the world. He is an expert on councils. He's also the guy that translated fundamentals of Catholic dogma uh, into English, the modern editions. He's the author of both of those. And we go over the documents of Vatican II. And of course, we also talk about the fact that liberalism has crept into so many churches. That cannot be denied. But the vision in and of itself of Vatican II was a good, was a wholesome vision. It didn't uh, advocate any removal of sacrificial elements of the mass. And it didn't advocate that Islam was a real religion or any of these kinds of changes that in and of itself is false. But are there problems in churches today? Without a doubt, they are. This is why we must band together and advocate for traditional values to remain. And I think really the only way to do that is to attend mass and to band together, not to abandon going to church. Otherwise, of course, uh, you're going to have those that are woke or those that completely deny traditional Catholic values. Um, they're going to take over. And if anybody wants an example of that, go to Germany, where there is a mess over there, man. You got the bishops. And I talked about Bavaria being beautiful. Yeah, but Bavaria, if you go to a mass over there, Elliot, I've been to masses over there with my family on a Sunday where the only people in there are us. And then there's other masses where they advocate women priests. They bless homosexual unions. And those churches are filled. Why? 
because the conservatives just they had enough of it and they stopped going to church. Well, what has happened now? Now you've got a massive movement in Germany where they're trying to advocate for gay marriage, women priests, and all kinds of liberalism. And for as much as people hate Pope Francis, what did he do? He came out and he rebuked them. Right. He said, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> and, but that's how, that is how the woke liberal crowd wins, Elliot. They win when we give up. Why would we give up? In a world that venerates inclusivity, it's one of the key mm. phrases, uh, where if you're ever exclusive, there's yep. something uh, maybe archaic, backwards, or toxic about you. The Catholic Church seems to be exclusive at its core, even though you know it may not seem that way in some circles. What does that mean and why are Catholics so exclusive? And does that make them uh, hateful? No, I don't think it does, uh, Elliot. I think it really is, is the message of Scripture and of the early church. You have to be part of the one true church of Christ. You should be part, excuse me, of the one true church of Christ. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing to urge people to join and be a part of the fullness of the faith. I've had people tell me, Elliot, I've had people say, well, uh, in the Bible, you know, people... You know, there's a passage in the Bible where the apostles are, are told to allow other people to follow the Lord, to not condemn them. Many things are really just ripped and wrenched out of context from Scripture. Anytime people in Scripture are worshiping, anytime they are following our Lord, they're part of that group of band of apostles. And that church gathered in council. In the book of Acts, chapter 15. So that's the church of God. And it continues throughout history. And if people say, well, that exclusivity, that's just anti-historical. No, it isn't. If you look from the 90s and the 100s, what does St. Ignatius of Antioch say? He's on his way to death, Elliot. They're about to murder him. They're about to martyr him. By the way, on his way to martyrdom, he says, he doesn't want any food. He doesn't want to sit down and have any any incredibly great food, all he craves is the body and the blood of our Lord. The bread of God, he calls the Eucharist. But on his way to martyrdom, Eliot, he identifies how one can find that church of Christ. And he talks about it being made up of bishops, deacons, and he says the name of that church is the Catholic Church. Now, I've heard people come back and say, well, uh, that's being used as descriptive. No, it's being used as descriptive and it's being used as the name of how you can find the true church. It was called the church. It was called the Catholic church. That's in his letter to the Smyrnians. As you go throughout history, the 100s, two, three, four, everywhere you look, when they talk about the faith, they then identify the name of that exclusively Christian church. And it was the Catholic church. So I don't think exclusivity is wrong. Rather, I think it's, I applaud it. I really do. So you, you mentioned Islam, and yep. I have a lot of Muslim fans probably watching this right now. Islam, from what I understand, is uh, the fastest growing religion on the, on the planet yep. right now. Um, and just to be uh, fair, I can see why. Now, I don't want to dive mm -hmm. down this road just yet but it seems as if there's a still there's still a more a sense of patriarchy and there oh, yeah. they seem a bit to have held on to its masculine core much more mm -hmm. so than the western faiths yeah but what would you say to someone who is is feel feels called to the god of abraham but just can't settle with what has transpired with the Western faiths, Christianity, and says, well, then Islam must be the way. Yeah. Number one, I, I would echo that. Um, and I, I'll add one other thing. Uh, I've debated a number of Muslim scholars. A number of them remain good friends to this day. 
I dialogue with him. Yeah. I may strongly disagree with Islam, but I've got friends that are Muslim scholars. Um, I've got a very good friend of mine who lives in England, one of my best friends. And um, I remember him talking to me about it, maybe about half a year back, telling me about how he went to mass in England and uh, the church was virtually empty. Yet the mosques over there are filled to the brim. He'll tell me how his friends, uh, by the way, I'm very glad for him. He's about to have a, a child, so great for him. But uh, he'll tell me how he has Muslim friends who are newly married, uh, maybe a few years married, and they're having children very often. And over in Western culture, the, the, the men are marrying, and you know, maybe they don't want to have kids. Maybe they just want to have pets. Well, that's exactly why Islam is, is growing as fast mm. as it is. <laughs> yeah, that so, makes sense. It really does make sense. So uh, that point being made, I would then talk about how as dark as things may seem, as, as lost as they may seem, in the 300s, Elliot, we had a period within the church where there was a terrible heretic by the name of Arius and his band of followers that were attacking the faith. They denied Christ was God. Christ was not eternal God. And it really seemed like all was lost, like they that they were the party that was going to win out at the Council of Nicaea. They went against apostolic doctrine. Their bishops and priests were running amok. You think things are bad now? Their <laughs> bishops and priests were running amok. The great St. Jerome recounted it by saying that he woke up to groan that the world was Aryan. That means the church was overrun by these these dastardly individuals. The great Saint Athanasius said that it was difficult to find anyone Orthodox. By Orthodox, we mean tiny O. We mean those that are following the true faith. Yet, the truth always wins out in the end. Eventually, they were defeated at the Council of Nicaea. They were defeated. Christ was declared God as biblically testified and as the early church fathers unanimously testify as well. And when things seemed at their darkest, those great figures that never bent the knee to this liberal new movement were vindicated by their apostolic victory, Elliot. I would tell those that are discouraged at this terrible time. It's a terrible time we're living in, man. Because right now, the liberal movement is just running rampant, out, you know, drowning out the conservative voices. I would echo the incredible faith of St. Athanasius, St. Jerome, and never give up, never give up that fight. And when they don't give up the fight, they'll realize in the end, truth always wins. The truth that Christ promised, that the gates of hell would never prevail over the church, that truth will win out. And um, that's something I would urge my, my um, Muslim friends to look at as well. Look at early church history. I know we disagree about the Bible. I know the arguments that they make about the Bible, and I know what the Quran teaches as well. But I think that once you look at early church history, it's a very different picture. And that picture only points towards Catholicism. And I invite them to study church history as well. I would love to dive deeper into Islam. And I think, I think we'll do that Definitely. on a different uh, on a different show. I'd love to have you back, by the way. And uh, Without I, a doubt, would love to be back. Let's, uh, let's just switch gears real quick here uh, before we begin to wrap up. <clears throat> let's continue, well, not, even, not really switch gears, but go along that same line of what has happened to the church, where we are right now, and you know, where yeah. we're going. Why is it that you find so many fallen away Catholics today? I yeah. being one that returned, but it seems... <laughs> as if there are so many baptized Catholics that just aren't Catholic anymore. What happened? Very poor catechizing. Very, very poor, Elliot. And uh, we find it today as well. Um, uh, the very unfortunate. Um, the bar is set very low, and, and it, it hurts me to say it, but um, it's getting better. The church is finally vetting uh, those that teach the faith better. But uh, the very fact that you could have liberal 
priests, liberal nuns, or liberal teachers teaching people with an RCIA is mind-blowing, Elliot. Yeah. The fact that you can have a deacon or a priest denying a dogma of the faith at the pulpit is mind-blowing. Now, does it continue to this day? Yeah, but it's being, it's, it's being cut down because, and you know why it's being cut down, Elliot? Because of those great conservative voices that have never given up, have never bent the knee, and are calling it to the attention and saying, we've had enough. We're sick of it. We want to go to mass to worship God the right way. And this is being cut down. But the reason there are so many falling away is because of the very poor catechesis. Um, and this is, this is an unfortunate thing. Now, I'll echo one other thing. It's horrible within Protestantism. Uh, any, just virtually anyone can become a teaching pastor and go into the pulpit and teach their version of theology. Right. So we're all in this boat of mess, but within Catholicism, uh, there is a fullness of the faith that we need to take advantage of. And I, I think that the church is doing a better job of vetting how people are teaching things. I think that bodes well for the future. You know, I have to say that I was pretty much fully catechized by YouTube. <laughs> to be honest, I, you know, I returned to the faith and I didn't even know where to begin. Uh, especially given that there's so many liberal parishes. And so yep. you go there and it does, they do not reflect the faith that is attractive to me and yep. definitely not attractive to a lot of the men that follow me. Um, and so mm -hmm. I've, I've found the likes of, you know, uh, of uh, uh, Father Ripperger mm -hmm. and Census Fidelium and, and so many others, so many great guys on YouTube that literally I came into the faith through their YouTube channels. You yeah. were on Pikes with Aquinas and yeah. um, uh, Matt Frad, right? that's the guy. Great channel. Yeah. Great, great channels. Channel. Great yeah, channels. So many, so many more. Uh, I just can't think of right now, but it's been yeah. through YouTube for me. What would you say to a young man who knows in his heart that he's being called to Christ and to participate in his baptismal rite? Because that's what I'm finding. There's a lot of, I'm yeah. so shocked. I, one of my friends did a survey the other day. He said, if you're, if you're Christian, what denomination? Overwhelmingly Catholic. Yeah. So many Catholic, but just not catechized, just not enrolled, just not uh, invested in the faith in a way that is, um, that is edifying and uplifting and masculine, if I will. Yeah. What would you say to one that is seeking in that way and where he can go or what he should do in order to strengthen his faith? Yeah, well, number one, I, I want to emphasize for, uh, for men out there, uh, Catholicism is a very masculine faith. And, uh, and for women out there, it is a very feminine faith as well, because the greatest of God's creations is a woman. And you can model out your life after those magnificent women saints, the incredible women and men. It doesn't get any more masculine than the incredible St. Joseph. What a magnificent figure and many others throughout history what i would tell them is find an incredible saint that you maybe can identify with read a little bit about that saint and get to church participate become active and become a voice of change look if you don't think you can cause or or, or help in the change of removing liberalism or removing people that are trying to break down conservatism well you're wrong you can don't ever forget the words of the great St. Athanasius, St. Jerome, when they were massively outnumbered. Things were as dark as they could be. You would have never imagined that they would have, that conservatism, the traditional faith would have prevailed, but it did prevail. And we have that promise from our Lord that we are not orphans, we will never be abandoned. And we're told in the book of Hebrews, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, you are not alone. Call upon those wonderful saints who are more alive now that they're in heaven than when they were here on earth. They're able to intercede for you. I think all of those things, Elliot, are incredible things that we can ponder upon. If you are a fallen away Catholic, uh, check out the videos in Pints with Aquinas. Check out videos on my channel. Uh, check out... Uh, census fidelium as it look if you don't like long long sermons 
they've got like 10 or 15 minute ones that are mind blowing there. Yeah. Incredibly traditional minded priests that preach the faith. And I think this is incredibly true. And if you're not Catholic, dig in more, dig in more and study more. I truly believe that you will become Catholic in the end. <laughs> What a high note to end on. I really appreciate that. That was beautiful. So uh, your website is patristicpillars.com. Yep. And you've got a load of articles and free information on there. I, I, yep. was, I don't want to say overwhelmed, but excited to see that there's so much that we could dig into. Uh, yep. You also are, have your two books, I, yep. I think can be found on Amazon. The secret they, history and you can even um yeah you can also find them on avamaria.net mm -hmm. and on the ewtn bookshop uh you can find them there as well uh they are available uh we're very very happy that uh people have been very edified by them both of them have been featured on ewtn and on um on other catholic stations as well um our goal in those books is to show people the ancient roots of the faith and to show them that they're not only historically based, they're very deeply rooted in the Bible. And we've had an overwhelming amount of evangelicals that have been, um, that have really appreciated them, Elliot. And I think that's the most beautiful thing that people that maybe didn't realize the beauty of the faith before are realizing it more and they're coming to the church. That to me is the most beautiful thing. And you have a YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, they can put real simple, put patristic pillars on YouTube. They'll find me there. Um, now, if you want to look for debates, I've done a number over at Pints with Aquinas, over at Reason and Theology, all over the, uh, the net, and for your Islamic followers. I have debated a number of Islamic scholars, including Dr. Shabir Ali and Dr. Mushadath Hussein. I highly recommend you go and you look at those debates. And for people that, this is the first time I'm saying it, Elliot, nobody knows yet. Your show will be the first time they hear it in January. I will be in Texas debating whose Mary is the historical Mary, the Catholic version or the Islamic version, with one of the top Islamic scholars in the world. And then in February, I'll be debating Dr. Shabir Ali on whether or not Christ is the suffering servant of the book of Isaiah. I highly recommend they check those out. Very good. Amazing. I can't wait. <laughs> I love hearing you speak, man. And this has been an amazing conversation. Can't wait to laugh. have you back, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, brother. I had a great time talking with you. Okay. Until next time, stay strong, bro. God bless. God bless.